and maybe some other people will join us as we go. So good morning, I'm Dave Cedarberg. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at Purdue. And uh, welcome to SMAP. This is our first Saturday morning astro session for the year. It's a good one. We have some good stuff today and we have some uh, exciting things coming up and, and some news I hope you'll be interested in. Let's go ahead and get started. I, I'd first like to have you meet uh, our presenting TAs. I have uh, six teaching assistants with me this morning who will actually each be presenting a part of what we do. Um, and so I'm just gonna ask them to introduce themselves briefly and, uh, and say something about what they're studying. And uh, then you'll know a little bit more about who they are. Dylan, let's start with you. Hi, my name is Dylan Caudill. I'm a senior in physics and astronomy here at Purdue. All right, great. Ethan. Hello, I'm Ethan. I'm also a senior here at Purdue in physics and astronomy. And what about Aiden? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aiden. Uh, I'm also a senior studying physics here at Purdue. All right. Thank you. Mariana. Hi, I'm a senior in planetary science at Purdue. And Thomas. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a sophomore studying physics and astronomy here at Purdue. OK, so finally, somebody who's not a senior. <laughs> and uh, Amelia. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia. I am also a senior in physics and astronomy at Purdue. Well, thank you all for being here. We have a few other uh, TAs who, who are either here or will be joining us. So uh, you will meet them at some point when we go to breakout rooms. Um, so this morning, we're going to present Stellarium, which is a fantastic program, web-based, for you to turn your computer into a planetarium. And so we're going to just show you some of the, some of the things that uh, you can do with Stellarium. I'm just going to turn it over to Dylan, who will kick us off with uh, with his portion. Dylan, take it away. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, so my part in this is I'm going to be introducing you to the features of Stellarium. So I'm going to share my screen, and all I'm going to ask is that you do your best to uh, follow along with me. Um, if I go too fast, you know, feel free to stop me. Um, we are going to try to keep things relatively timed here. So I may just uh, tell you to wait till the breakout rooms to ask any questions. Um, but when you click the link to Stellarium or if you type Stellarium into your browser, this is the screen I should ask first. Can everybody see my screen right now? Perfect. Yes. Yep. So uh, there is gonna be at the top of your screen, a lot of different versions of Stellarium. There is a downloadable version, but it takes a lot of time and it's fairly big. Uh, so for today's purpose, we're going to use the web app. So up here where it says Stellarium Web, go ahead and click that. And it is going to send you into something that looks like this. Uh, it's going to have some pop-ups. Go ahead and uh, click through those. And then there's going to be these three little bars. Uh, and go ahead and click those to get rid of that sidebar. And what it should do is, like it has for me, take you to the night sky from where you are roughly um, tonight. So when it becomes dark out, it would be a, a version of what you can see. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through a lot of the features on this page and introduce you to them. Uh, some of them I'll tell you, we'll talk about in more depth later as our other speakers uh, come up and present them. And we're gonna do some fun things with it today. Um, so we're gonna start down here. Is everybody on this page? Anybody have any trouble getting to this part uh, first? All right. Um, what you can do if you want to follow along directly is I would uh, have the Zoom share screen open on one side of your screen and then uh, have Stellar your own Stellarium open on the other because I'm going to go through the features and I, I think it would be really helpful if you go through it with me, um, but it is up to you. So we're going to start down here in the bottom left. And for me, this gray box says physics building. For you, it might not say anything at all. For um, if you have it kind of split screen, it might just have like a little location pin. Uh, but if you click on it, it's going to have your location related features. Uh, for right now, it won't matter too much. Ethan's going to talk more about this later when we get into it. Um, but that's just what that box does. Um, next in the bottom right, and I'm going to, if you're following along with me, I'd ask you to do this with me. We're going to click on this bottom right box with all these numbers. Uh, you should recognize this as the date and time. And what I'm going to ask everybody to do is hit this pause button. Uh, we're not going to get into the details of this. Aiden will explain that later. 
Uh, but for now, we're going to stop time wherever you are. And over on the right hand side, kind of where I'm circling here, is the time window. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the 24 hour time clock. That's what Stellarium operates on. Um, I think the easiest way that I've come up with to explain this is traditionally for people in the United States, we have a 7 a.m. and a 7 p.m. Um, on a 24 hour time clock, when you hit noon, uh, you keep counting. So 12 noon would be 12 p.m. And then it goes one o'clock would be 13, two o'clock would be 14. It just keeps going. Uh, so we're all going to go to 23. Uh, and that is by adjusting these, uh, this left hand most number using the arrows to go up and down. Uh, and you'll see that the sky adjusts as you do that. Uh, Dylan, can yeah. I interrupt you for just a minute? Yeah. I just want to make sure uh, it, for the for the people who are trying to have Stellarium on one side of their screen and um, Zoom on the other side, it, is anybody having trouble doing what they want to do? If you are, just let us know and we'll pause here for a minute. Are, are you where you want to be? Does anybody have a question? Anybody having trouble? Let us know if we go too fast. Yes, please do. Um, I have a tendency to do that. So thank you, Dave. What I'll ask you to do is just set this to 23 hours and zero minutes. The seconds won't matter as much, but for the purpose of this tutorial, I want everybody to have a night sky. Uh, it'll be different depending where you are in location, uh, but I just want everybody to kind of see roughly what I'm seeing. Um, and you can click around with the mouse and move around if you'd like. Uh, to kind of see what would be in the night sky tonight. Uh, today is October 14th, 2023. Um, so uh, is everybody at this point, anybody have any trouble getting to this point, like Dave mentioned, uh, please let us know, put something in the chat. Um, if anybody else sees that, please stop me too. Um, so that's what those two features do. Those are kind of the, uh, the primary functions, which is why we're going to have Aiden and Ethan talk about those later. Uh, I'm going to go through the rest of this bottom bar down here. Uh, at the very bottom middle of your screen. Uh, some of these icons are going to be highlighted already, and some of them are not. We'll start from the left. You'll have the constellations button, and hitting this will pop up all the constellations um, in the traditional uh, Western sky culture uh, that you would normally think of, and you can hit that again to get rid of those. Uh, you can also put the art on. I, as some of you may know they're associated with um, different animals and things like that, and they have a nice little art feature. Um, what you may have noticed is that there's kind of these silhouettes of what looks like trees and houses. If you're in a different location, it may be different. This next button, uh, these next two actually, uh, the one to the right is landscape, and clicking that will get rid of it, and it replaces the horizon line with this kind of uh, faded white line. So you can still keep track of your stuff, but you can see the objects that you can't see uh, in the night sky tonight. And then there's this atmosphere button. Uh, so when you look up into the night sky, there's all sorts of atmospheric factors. Stellarium tries to uh, mimic that, but you can also get rid of that as if you were looking at the night sky with no atmospheric interruptions uh, to see more stars, uh, if, if you will. You, if you take away the landscape, then you can see what is actually below the horizon. Yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. So if I can steer this back here. Um, so that's what those two features do. Now, the next two uh, may be confusing to people that uh, don't have kind of a, a background in astronomy. There's a concept called the celestial sphere. It was introduced by ancient astronomers, uh, but it's basically a way for us as humans to map out the stars using a coordinate system. So you draw a giant sphere around the Earth in its center, and this kind of is Stellarium's depiction of that. So this first one called the azimuthal grid, um, I'm going to put the landscape back on so it's not so jarring to look at. This creates the celestial sphere around your current position. So you'll look directly above you. This is what we call the zenith right at the top. Um, and it's basically a way for you to uh, map stars from your current location. So going right to left, uh, north to east and south and west, it starts at zero degrees at north and ends at 360 going all the way around the circle. So 90 degrees at east, uh, 180 at south, and then it counts up in degrees. That's the altitude. Um, and it kind of, if you look all over to the sides, I know it's kind of tough to see 
uh, it has those degree markings out there. So uh, that's what the azimuthal grid does. It shows your, it's relative to your current position. Uh, the equatorial grid uh, is going to be a little bit off. This uh, is the celestial sphere, but based on Earth's axes. So the North Star, which is traditionally above the North Pole, is going to be near the top of this. So this is the, what you would traditionally think of um, when people say the North Star. It's based on, on this kind of grid. Um, so that's what those features are. They're just really useful tools for uh, astronomers to locate things. It's things that I use. Um, this next button shows deep sky objects. So you might have noticed as I looked around or as you look around, there are certain things that are highlighted and circled. This is selecting this button will get rid of those highlights and uh, make it so that you have a more cleaner look, but it also is nice for finding certain galaxies and stuff like that. Um, these last two buttons, you have a full screen mode if you wanted to see it and uh, get rid of the browser view, and then you also have night mode. Uh, red light, it helps your eyes adjust to dark, so if you were using this while you were observing like I do, uh, this would be really useful if you um, were out actually looking at the night sky and wanted and to see better uh, rather than looking at just the normal screen. But for the purposes of this, we'll do um, the normal night sky. Does anybody have any questions about anything I just went over immediately or anything like that? Did everybody, everybody able to keep up pretty well? All right, I will take silence as a good sign and I will... Uh, Stop sharing my screen. I'm going to pass it over to Ethan, who is going to talk to you about your location and locating objects in the night sky with Stellarium. Possibly. All right. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, I can. All right, great. Well, I'm Ethan. Yeah, I'm going to be showing you how to change your location and how to locate objects in the night sky. Uh, as mentioned before, there's a small gray box down in your bottom left corner. This is the map. This is how you choose your location wherever you want on Earth to see the night sky. The night sky is different for everyone depending on where you are on Earth. So we're going to change it so we can uh, uh, so you can look at from where you are. Uh, the first option up here is auto location. Uh, if you allow the Stellarium website to use your location, turning on auto location will put you smack dab where you are. So I'm not going to zoom in too close because this is my house, but uh, this is my location. I'm currently in West Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, now the other option to how to choose somewhere is the search bar right here. Uh, the, the, using the search bar, you can change your location to anywhere on Earth, or you can drag this pin, but it's much simpler to use the search bar. Uh, someone give me a name of a city in Europe. Anyone? London. London? All right. So we'll search up London in here. You see there's a whole host of different Londons, but London and England, United Kingdom. And there we are. Zoom out, you can see smack dab in the middle of London. Now to use the location that you want to use, uh, hit the use this location button up here. If you don't, then uh, it's not going to change your location. So I click that. As you can see, my night sky has changed. Does anyone have any questions so far? Any difficulties changing the location? Okay, well, I'm going to change my location back to West Lafayette. Use this location. Perfect. Okay, now, as mentioned before, the night sky is different for anyone, and there is plenty to see. Um, what, what types of objects you can find in Solarium? You can find planets, stars, galaxies, nebulae, satellites, there's a whole host. It, it, there is a lot in here and it can be difficult to try to find all of them. How, how do you search for an object you want to? Well, 
That's what this nifty search bar up here is for. Similar to the location, you can type in something you want to see. Uh, someone give me the name of a galaxy they want to look for. Anyone? Andromeda. Andromeda. Okay. So we'll search up Andromeda. Yeah, it's uh, Andromeda Nebula. It shows up as Andromeda Nebula. That's just a naming convention, but this is what we're looking for. And look at that. It has changed our view to look at the Andromeda galaxy. Now, it's a little bit fuzzy. This is what you can expect normally if you're looking at it from the ground, but Stellarm has a neat feature where you can zoom in and it'll show you real images from uh, various sky surveys. So right now, you are looking at an actual image taken of Andromeda with its uh, various other uh, orbiting galaxies, dwarf galaxies. Now, I think this is really neat. Uh, what else you can find is anytime you click on an object, say Andromeda or even any other star, you'll find a, um, a sort of blurb on the side. It's an information box. It'll tell you the name. You know, you can find its brightness, its coordinates, as well as a lot more information on a Wikipedia link that it will provide for you. And so you can do this for anything in the night sky, uh, stars, clusters, planets. See, there's a, another galaxy over here, shows you images. All right, does anyone have any questions right now? Any questions? Does anyone have another object they want to look at? Want to yeah. search? We, we can try another object. Uh, give me the name of a planet. Any, any planet. Saturn? Even Pluto. Saturn? Okay. You can look up Saturn. Saturn the planet. There are changes to its location. So currently you can see it is up tonight in the night sky, at least for me in Indiana. So we can zoom in. And there we have it. You have Saturn and its moons. Another feature on here is that um, the further you zoom in, the more objects, the more fainter objects show up. And uh, what comes along with that is the names right here. You can't see the um, moons, but as you zoom in, you can find them and any information about them. Yeah, this is a great resource. Uh, I recommend on your own having fun, just playing around with it and looking for different objects and seeing what you can learn about them. Uh, that's all I have for now. I'm going to pass on to Aiden, who's going to take you on a journey through time. Um, I have a question. Oh, yep. Yeah, go ahead. So, would this show, um, like moving satellites, like in for life, or? Yeah. Yes. Yes. This this does. Um, currently, as we have it, uh, the time is locked, but when it's unlocked and you're zoomed out sufficiently, you can actually see satellites moving across the night sky. All right, thank you. And now I'll pass on to Aiden. All right, thanks, Ethan. I will share my screen. Does that appear for everyone? Yes. Yes. Okay, thanks. OK, so I'm Aiden. Uh, I'll be talking to you about some of the time and date features of Stellarium that we've already kind of been introduced to. Um, uh, with the bottom right hand uh, clock option. But first, um, I'd just like to say that in astronomy, time is one of the most important aspects that we can consider and factor into things. Uh, and we can even change the time, uh, like we've already seen, just changing our time to 11 p.m. Now, why might uh, why might we want to do this? Why might we want to change time in astronomy? To maybe predict where, like, a certain object that you're observing is, like, where it's going to be? Mm -hmm. 
we can do things like that uh, as well as make, yeah, like uh, different kinds of predictions. So um, a little bit later, I'll be talking about how we can even predict things like eclipses uh, and things like that. So going back to the clock, we've already talked about how to change time with uh, with the arrows. We can go forward, we can go back, and as we do that, we can also see that the sky changes. But we also have a slider option, and this is highlighted here on the bottom. Uh, currently, the slider is set to about like one fourth through the night, which the night corresponds to this dark area in the bar. And if we click on the slider option, we can even smoothly change the uh, the time to see the night sky change ever so subtly throughout the night. And uh, doing this is not always the most helpful, but if you just want to see things like um, move through the sky or see if like where it'll be at a particular time throughout the night, so say for Saturn, if you want to see how it changes throughout the night. So do something like that. Um, about the slider as well, uh, it also shows things like your dark night, which is when the night is absolutely dark. There is no other light interfering. Uh, for instance, with twilight, you can see that some of the sunlight actually has an impact uh, indirectly on the atmosphere, which uh, prevents us from being able to see uh, certain things. Uh, additionally, we also have a calendar option. Oh, sorry, I should go back. Um, we also have the ability to change the date. So we can even go as far forward into the future. So this is, we're going years into the future. This is what the sky will look like. But we can also go back and see events that have already occurred. As well as, yeah, when we go into the future, we can see, uh, we can predict certain events. And okay, talking about that, we have a go back to the time. We have a calendar. Uh, sorry, we have a uh, option on the clock to go back to real time, and this will just go back to whatever your current time is. So right now it's day, and you can see that moon is getting pretty close to the sun where I am. Um, and this might be useful for, say, if you're out in the field and you're going forward in time a bit to see what the sky will look like throughout the night. And if you just want to quickly go back to your current time, you can just hit that button. OK. Uh, does anyone have any questions about what I've talked about so far? OK. Uh, Another time feature of Stellarium is we can, in the top right hand of the uh, screen, there's this observe box. And if we click that, we come to this observation logbook, but that's not important unless you're signed in. But more importantly, we have this calendar option. And if we click that, we can see a list of different events that Stellarium already has for us, um, depending on the year that you set in the clock down here. And we can go through the entire year and see various events. So if we go back to April, we can see everything. Uh, we can see new moons. There's a solar eclipse in April. Um, and we can also apply this to uh, time into the future and uh, in the past. So I have a historical example that I don't want you guys to uh, do right now. I just want to show you that it's possible. So first, I'm going to 
go all the way back to 1919. And we can do that by clicking and holding the year to go by more quickly. OK, it's 1919. And say I want to go to the calendar and see what happened in 1919. OK, we have some eclipses. But one I'm particularly interested in occurred in May on the 29th. So if we click on that, it'll automatically set our time to, to that, that time. Now, we can see that there's an eclipse that is almost occurring, but it's not quite there. And if we want, we can also see how the eclipse will appear uh, at different locations on Earth, going back to the uh, location feature we've already used. For this particular eclipse, it occurred about, it peaked around down here. So I'm going to set location. And now using the slider, I can change the time to see when this eclipse will peak. Oh, and there it is. <laughs> so the moon completely covers the sun. We can turn the atmosphere off to see that too. So just a quick trivia question. Uh, does anyone know why this particular eclipse is important? It's related to uh, physics. Yes? I believe it's when they prove the theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. That's right. They uh, were able to use the eclipse to predict uh, they understood that the location of a particular star would be somewhere. And using relativity, they were able to predict where it would be when light uh, curves around the sun. And yep, that helped predict uh, general relativity. Uh, and so with that, I think that's really everything I wanted to cover uh, considering time. So I think I will pass it off to Amelia. Yep, sounds good. Right, I'll stop. Thank sharing. you, Aiden. All right, and I'll share my screen. All right, can everyone see me and hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about constellations. Um, let me move my. I got like all these. Ooh little widget bars around. Okay. All right. So we're in Stellarium. Um, yeah. But before you get started, could you go yes. full screen so we don't see the, the, the bars at the top? Yes. There we go. All right. Does that look better? Yeah, much better. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, all right. So Dylan talked about these two buttons here at the bottom, the constellations and the constellation art. And um, if we press those, we get a bunch of constellations that come on our screen and some art that goes with some of the, some of the lore behind them. Um, can somebody name me a constellation that they know of that they might see in the night sky? Orion. Excuse me? Orion. Orion, yes. Orion should be um, below the horizon right now, but it will be coming up um, soon. Uh, here's Orion and it's labeled, it's got the lines connecting the stars. Um, and uh, with Stellarium, it can, you can use it to uh, help identify and um, kind of trace out the shapes of the constellations in the night sky. Um, constellations are helpful when you're locating objects um, and different, different like deep sky objects like we saw like Andromeda will be identified using their constellation. Um, so you can uh, view artwork that goes with these constellations and 
this artwork is based on a lot of times the mythology of the place that um, named the constellation. So in the Northern Hemisphere in, um, in America, North America, we use this set of constellations. And if you get the downloaded version of Solarium, you can actually uh, get a, uh, a tool that will let you view constellations in other cultures and other parts of the world. Um, we're kind of interested. You guys see this constellation right here, Ursa Major. Do you see a familiar pattern in Ursa Major? Um, and if so, what do you guys call that pattern? I see Naomi raised raised your hand. No, that's yes. the Big Dipper. The Big it. Dipper. Yep, yep. This this part right here is part of um, Ursa Major. Uh, a lot of places call it the Big Dipper. Um, some places call it other things, though. So we are kind of interested in seeing what everybody calls it. Anybody else have any other names for it? Well, we looked um, at some other constellation uh, types, some some different naming conventions, and some people call it like uh, the snake. Some people um, there's a lot of different names for it, but it's it's part of Ursa Major. So I want to show you guys something else you can do that's related to the constellations. If you go up to the top left here and click on these bars, you get um, settings. Um, you can go to view settings and view settings lets you put more things on your celestial sphere that help you better understand the night sky. Um, we're going to click on ecliptic line here and check that. And I'm going to close out of click the bars again to close out of that tab. And now you'll see in my night sky, there's a big red line. Does anybody know what the ecliptic line is by any chance? The path of the sun. It is the path of the sun. Yep. Perfect, Isabel. Yep. So the, the sun moves a little bit every day as we revolve around it. Um, and so its location in our sky changes a little bit every day. And it traces out this path called the ecliptic line. And the ecliptic line is special with respect to the constellations because um, there's a set of constellations that fall along the ecliptic line that go by a special name. Does anybody know what that is? Zodiac. The zodiac. Yes, perfect. And about how many constellations are in the zodiac? Fifteen. Fifteen. Close, Thir very 13. close. Hmm? 13. 13. 13, 12 or 13. Um, I think uh, by definition, there's 12, but there's also a 13th one that isn't really like considered part of the zodiac, but also falls along the ecliptic. Um, but yeah, you can see here Sagittarius, Aquarius, Pisces, these are all zodiac constellations. And if you look under the horizon, you can see more of them. Um, and you can see, looky there, there's the sun along the ecliptic line. Any questions on that? Um, I know that a is like the uh, 13th one, but I'm not sure. Like, I think I heard somewhere that there was a, another one. Another but one? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, it kind of depends on where astronomers like to put the boundaries for what defines a constellation. Um, if you uh, look at some planetarium apps or sky charts, they'll put blocks in between each of the um, constellations to kind of define, okay, this is where one constellation starts. This is where the next constellation starts. Constellations are just configurations of stars in the night sky. They're kind of arbitrary. 
um, it's they're kind of just ways to define locations in the sky. So where we define one constellation starting and one constellation ending uh, can change. Um, so that can change how many constellations we say are along the zodiac. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. yep. Anything else? All right, that's all I have. And I believe we're moving on to Mariana. Yeah, I'll take over. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, okay. Cool, so now we're gonna do a uh, little group activities in breakout rooms. And so the activity we're gonna be doing is you're gonna use Stellarium to find what was in the night sky on the day you were born? And so it's important to use the skills you've learned in the lesson that all the TAs have described. Um, and so the main things that you should remember for this activity, um, but you can always ask the TAs um, in the breakout rooms if you get a little lost, but remember to change the location in the bottom left-hand corner to where you were born. So um, remember to do that. And then change the time um, to the day you were born as well. As remember to change the year. And um, you can change other factors, play around with it to change the atmosphere, landscape. You can put grids, anything you want to put on there. And so look to see if there's any objects or constellations, galaxies, nebula, anything like that, that stood out on the day you were born. But yeah, that's... Um, a quick summary of the activity we're going to do. So does anyone have any questions before we go ahead and get started? We are good to go. I have three breakout rooms. All right. I will open all the rooms. Have fun. Uh, does SMRE have like a scale? Like, like the, um, the size of the things? Sure. Yes, it does. So, uh, but the size that it gives isn't your traditional, like, it's this many light years or it's um, this many parsecs. It's uh, talking about size in terms of um, angular size. So you'll see there's like little uh, markings. Those will be uh, arc seconds. Um, it's a unit of measurement for like measuring the angle of something on the celestial sphere. Um, and it's the size that you would need, like if you were to image it, um, you would have uh, a camera basically that is only so many um, covers only so much of an area of that. So for something like the Andromeda, you'd have to create like a mosaic where you'd have to take pictures of different pieces to build it all together. Um, but this version of Stellarium does not have the size in terms of uh, scale of the object like that. Um, the downloadable version, and we didn't want everybody to download it. It's a it's a big thing. Um, if they didn't have the the time and it's a little bit more complex, but it would have information like that. Um, and if you, it, I believe every blurb for each object has a Wikipedia tab that you can go to. And typically things like that would have the size listed on there as well. Um, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, now okay. I have another question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, does like the size that a solar room shows for like stars and everything, is that the apparent magnitude or or more close to the real magnitude? I would so, guess apparent magnitude. So for the magnitude they show, I'm pretty sure, I, I, I would need to double check this. I'm pretty sure it's apparent uh, and it adjusts to where you are um, sometimes, but yeah, I, I believe it is apparent magnitude um, in that magnitude that they give. I, I'm not sure if the web version factors in um, the atmosphere when it does that. Some, like the the download version I use, I'm I do stellar astronomy uh, research. So when I go to observe an object, I actually use Stellarium in the past to make sure like the moon wasn't covering my object. Um, going using that feature to go forward in time, um, and I in the the web version has things like air mass and. Uh, a little bit more of the atmospheric details. So I think on that one, it changes a little bit depending on uh, what you would actually be able to see. Uh, but for the web version, I think it just gives the apparent magnitude flat. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, I want to check in with Naomi and Anish. How are you guys doing on the activity? Are you seeing anything interesting? Um, uh, I, I mean, I was born in Beaverton, so I just kept that at that mm -hmm. location. Um, but I just because uh, I was curious, I also added like the meridian line and the settings. Perfect. Yeah. It looks like it kind of like intersects or like overlaps with the, uh, with the ecliptic line. Yeah. Yeah, the meridian line will. Um... If you pop up the azimuthal grid, it should go across your meridian. Um, it's a way to just have the meridian without um, actually pulling up the big grid. Um, yeah. And yeah, is there any interesting objects near your zenith on that night? It doesn't have to be like if you don't know the time you were born, but like if you pull up that azimuthal grid, if you stare directly up, there's that kind of uh, that point where it intersects. Is there anything interesting up there? Uh, any stars, galaxies, constellations? Uh, yeah, I see like uh, something called like the Cos Borealis, I think. Yeah. Not sure I know what that is. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, not exactly on the zenith that I have. Apparently, the North America Nebula within oh, nice. that. Nice. Nice. Uh, anything. Um... Anything in particular in the night sky as a whole that interests you guys? Any kind of like anything around uh, like what kind of objects interest oh, yeah. you? Like, um, I think there's something called like uh, the thing, uh, the new Scorpio or something. I think it's like a double star in like a solar system or something. Ooh. It's like two stars. Yeah. We got a we got Orion up above or some major. Some cool constellations. Jupiter looks to be right on the horizon. Wow. Yeah, Sounds like you got juice. lucky. Yeah. <laughs> all the planets are uh, below the horizon for me. All, all right next to the sun, too. Hmm. Oh, Andromeda was in the night sky, too. Like you're getting all the good stuff on your birthday. Oh, yeah. I have uh, Sagittarius is out. Hercules, it's a neat one. Ursa Minor, Ursa Major. Yeah. Oh, look at that. There is a satellite up here just passing by. Can we see someone else's screen? Has anyone shared their screen yet? If someone wants to give me their birthday, I can change to them. Yeah, sure. No, no. Okay. Well, so my birthday is 11 of April of 2008 in Medellin, Colombia. Pardon? Yeah, Ethan, it's M E D E L L I N, Medellin, Colombia. A beautiful place to be. <laughs> okay. Using this location. Oh wow, you had uh, a lot nicer night sky on your birthday than I did. Wow. Yeah, you have much of the um the disc of the Milky Way. Very nice. So yeah, what do we see here? Hey, you mentioned before you have Saturn, Mars, and the Moon. All these uh, zodiac constellations: Libra, Virgo, Leo, Gemini, Cancer. Classics, if I have to say anything about it. I'm impressed with the uh, being able to see the Milky Way. You know, it's great. It's, um, yeah, different times of year. It's either uh, uh, flatter or more um, vertical. Like, like for me, it, it was more vertical on my birthday. Yeah, very nice. Uh, yeah. It's below. 
So are you a uh, Pisces or an Aquarius? Whichever one of those. Well, I, I am an Aries. So an Aries. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's right there. Yeah, I'm I'm still a little confused on uh zodiacs a bit because these didn't line up for me either. Yeah. Hmm. My birth is October twenty eighth. Okay. Do you, do you have any questions about what we're doing? No. Because this is something that you guys can all do, you know, on your own in your own free time. Our goal was to show you how to use the program. Here's a. Uh... Something pretty neat as uh, when, when I was showing how to sh uh, find your location and how to find objects, I pointed out that the more you zoom in, the more you can see. As you can see right here, we're outside of the band of the Milky Way. There's a lot of stars and it's very cluttered. You can see some galaxies here and there. So yeah, it's a really interesting object to both view through a telescope if you're in the Southern Hemisphere and um, just for astronomers too. Aiden, it says the large Magellanic Cloud is a barred spiral galaxy. I mean, <laughs> it's a little, <laughs> it's got somewhat of a barred shape. Does it? Okay. I thought it was irregular, but well, I guess. I, I think it's more irregular than barred, but like kind of. Mm. Interesting. It has guess, some uh, structure. I just popped in here. Uh, do we want to bring it back together in the main session? Uh, I think. So can... how, how are you yeah. guys doing? Yeah, I think we can do that. We All can right. do that. Yeah. Yep. Thank uh, you guys yeah. for chatting. It, it was brought out in a couple of places that there is a downloadable version of Stellaria. Uh, it, it's uh, fairly large in size uh, and uh, a little more sophisticated in operation and also more powerful. You can certainly look into that if you'd like to explore uh, Stellarium in a little more detail uh, than is available on the, on the web version. Uh, we're gonna repeat an experiment that was uh, originally done by uh, an ancient Greek named Eratosthenes. Uh, Eratosthenes lived in uh, Northern Egypt uh, about 2,300 years ago, and he came up with a unique way to measure the circumference of the earth. The year 245 BC, the place northern Egypt. A curious mathematician, musician, philosopher, and geographer calculated the circumference of the earth to surprising accuracy, armed with a vertical stick, a meter stick or measuring tape, and the noonday sun, you can do it too. Hi, this is Dave Cedarberg from Purdue Saturday Morning Astrophysics. Eratosthenes in the great city of Alexandria, Egypt, learned that the shadow cast by an object in the noonday sun was longer or shorter than the shadow cast in a more northern or southern location. Based on the comparative difference between the angles of the sun's rays and the distance between the two locations, Eratosthenes found a way to calculate the circumference of the earth. I'm going to show you how to repeat Eratosthenes' experiment and you can do it for yourself. In order to do this experiment, you will need some sort of vertical stick or pole. You'll need a measuring tape or meter stick, a way to measure the length of the shadow, and you'll need the noonday sun. You will need to know the length of the pole and the length of the shadow that it casts. You'll want to take your measurement at exactly solar noon. Now, solar noon is when the sun is at its highest point in the sky. You can figure out solar noon at your location with a simple Google search. At solar noon, you want to align the pole exactly vertically. We'll show you multiple ways to do this. On this pole, we have a little bubble level on the top so we can tell when it's perpendicular to the ground. You need a level surface on the ground and at the right time, solar noon, measure the length of the shadow from the edge of the pole to the outside edge of the shadow. And in this case, we have about 39.5 centimeters. Measure the length to the nearest 
0.1 centimeter. We'll show you another way to create a vertical pole. We have a photographic tripod. I have a wooden dowel with a hole drilled through it and a string to hang it from the handle of the tripod. We want to make sure that it just barely touches the ground, hangs vertical, and then we can measure the shadow. All right, and here's still another way. We've taken some cardboard squares or triangles, glued them together to make a corner, and glued a vertical stick in the corner. If I set this down on level ground, it'll be vertical, and I can measure the shadow. Just like Eratosthenes, you will need two locations to complete your calculations. You have your own data. Once you record your data and upload it, we'll provide you a link to other locations that you can use to compare and complete your calculations. There is no sound to this. I'm just going to narrate. Uh, we're taking a couple of cardboard triangles. We're gluing them to a base so that they form a right angle that will be perpendicular to the base. And we're gonna tape a pencil. You can use a pencil or any kind of a stick. We'll measure the shadow coming off the back of the, of the uh, stick holder. We need two measurements. We need the measurement of the shadow, the measurement of the height of the stick. And, and I will give you links and email to all this information. What I would like to ask you to do is participate in this experiment. Uh, you will need these things to measure. Number one, your exact latitude. And I will show you, in fact, I can just tell you, if you use your phone or your computer and Google your location, you'll find, based on your city, you'll find your latitude uh, in degrees. So. The first piece of information you'll need is your latitude, how many degrees north or south of the equator. You'll need the length of the pole, the length of the shadow, and the direction that it points. Does the shadow point north or does it point south? You'll need to know the time, the exact time that you take your measurement, and you'll need to know the time that we call solar noon. That's the time when the sun is at its highest point in the sky, the meridian. It's important that you take your shadow measurement exactly at solar noon to get the, to get the, the most accurate measurement. Once you collect those pieces of data, you can go to this location, this link, and I will send you this form so you can keep track of your data. I'll send you the link and record your data. You will end up here. And the data, the Eratosthenes data entry, you're gonna to click to uh, enter your data and you're gonna enter right here, those measurements that you just took. Now, one question you may have is, how do you find solar noon? Well, I'm gonna use a website called Time and Date. And you, again, I will give you this link. If you want to know where when solar noon is at your time, you go to this link, you click on sun calculator. So sun, moon, and space, sun calculator. And enter your location. So let's say I want to go to Beaverton, Oregon. Beaverton, Oregon, in the U.S., the northwestern part of the country. I'm going to, going to scroll down, and I will see a table here that lists solar noon for every day of the month. So solar noon, I'm going to find the day of the month. Today's the 14th. In fact, the 14th is highlighted. And I see the meridian. There is solar noon right there. 12.57 p.m. So if you're in Beaverton, Oregon, at least one person in the group is, there's your solar noon. I think that's all you need to know. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let you ask me questions. While you're thinking, I'm going to tell you, I've given you the basics 
to gather data to do this experiment. We're going to meet again in a few weeks before our November SMAP, and I will lead you through how to do the calculations. Uh, in the information that I send you, there'll be instructions on how to do the calculations if you want to go ahead and do that. But I will, uh, I will help you as needed when we meet again. So, um, and also at that time, I'll give you the, the logic behind Eratosthenes' method of doing this. It's just based on the fact that at one location, there is a given length of a shadow. And, and what we really are interested in is not the length of the shadow itself, it's the angle between the shadow and the stick, and at another location, the angle between the shadow and the stick. And the difference in those two angles will help us calculate the circumference of the Earth. It's an easy process. It's brilliant. So um, I will make you an offer. If you, I'd like to have everybody do this experiment. If you will do the experiment, enter your data, and send me, uh, you, you don't have to send me a photo. But if you want to, want to send me a photo of yourself collecting the data, how you do it, I will send you a SMAP sticker, SMAP laptop, laptop sticker, and I will send you a Purdue Physics and Astronomy sticker as well. So help me out with a photo and I'll send you a couple stickers. If you don't wanna do a photo or don't have the time and just wanna do the experiment, I'll take your data. This only works if I have data from two locations far apart north, south. So if I get a measurement from Beaverton, Oregon, which is far north, and a measurement from Medellin, Colombia, which is far south, that's the best. The farther away, the better. But measurements in between will be fine as well. I'll help you with the calculations. I'll tell you what to do in our next session. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. Who has a question now? Who can I answer a question for? So from what I understood, um, every place where like people are taking the data uh, does it in its local um, solar noon, right? That is correct. So what we're comparing is the shadow of, this, of the stick. And if you do your measurement at solar noon where you are, then everybody's measurement will be equivalent. That's a great question. The closer you are to solar noon, the better. Like within a minute or two is, is the best. Thank you for that question. Could I get some reactions? Who's gonna do this experiment? Give me a thumbs up. Give me some feedback. Okay, I'm back in gallery view. I can see anybody that wants to be seen. We're gonna sign off here shortly and I'll take a last minute question if anybody has one. You're not all asleep, are you? We only have to do uh, one measure, right? Only or... one. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So all you have to do is go through step seven on, on the sheet that I send you. I, I didn't send you the sheet yet. but So we're going to give you a couple of weeks to do this because you're all in school during the week. You can't go make, make a shadow measurement on you know next Wednesday. So we'll give you a couple of weekends to try and get your shadow measurements. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, please let me know. With that, I wanna thank the TAs who did one terrific job in, uh, in pulling this together this morning. You all did really well, and I'm proud of every one of you. Uh, we learned a lot about Stellarium. It's a good place to begin our year with, uh, with SMAP. We're gonna come back to Stellarium again uh, before the, uh, probably before the end of the year. And so um, it's, it's a great tool and something that I certainly enjoy myself. Um, with that, I'm gonna say, go have some fun. If it's clear skies where you are and the eclipse is visible, enjoy it. Don't look at the sun. That's not a problem here because it's cloudy. All right, everybody, have a good weekend and uh, we'll see you Thank You've you. been snapped. See you next time. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.